Hey everybody, Lars here. Time for review video one for Big Bad Unit 5. Uh, Unit 5 is neat though. Unit 5 isn't necessarily going to teach you any new ways to do programming. It's going to teach you a way to organize the way you do your programming. You'll know what I'm talking about when we get into it. You probably already read the slides and kind of have a gist for what we're doing. Um, let me get a slurp of coffee. Oh, I got my new... Leonardo da Vinci book in the mail today. Isaacson, the guy who wrote the uh, Einstein book and a lot of other things. Anyway, it's heavy as hell. It's like it's almost like it weighs like 20 pounds. So I'm like, what's going on here? And then when you open it up, you realize the paper is all color and it's all really good quality paper and you get all of da Vinci's drawings and the, the paper stock is incredible. Uh, looking for the Mona Lisa... Madonna with the yard winder. I think that was stolen by the Nazis. Anyway, this is... I can't wait to get into this. I can't, though, because it's the middle of the semester. And I have to do my job. And I have to do my... Oh, school. And I have to do this class. So, I'm going to wait. Hopefully, maybe I get into it a little bit over Thanksgiving break. And then when Christmas comes around, I'm really going to pile in. All right. Um, This is the first video for object orientation. And basically, the story behind object orientation is that most people, programming rears its ugly head in the 50s with uh, Harvard Basic and some other popular languages. I mean, in the past, everything was written from scratch for the particular machine that you were using. Um, the machines during the war, the ENIAC, they all had, you know, custom programs written for them in assembly language or whatever the machine language was for the machines. When you started getting higher level languages where you could basically code what you wanted to and then it would be compiled or translated into the ones and zeros that the computer understands. You started with Harvard Basic and then you went on to Fortran, which was a very popular scientific language. And then you had structured languages like Pascal. That's what I learned in in the 80s and things along those lines. Um, basically, these languages were for imperative programming, which is exactly what you've been doing. Think about it and I always compare it to uh, baking a cake. You have your data, which is your ingredients, and then you have your recipe, which is the steps that you need to follow to get to the goal, which in the case of a recipe would be to bake a cake, or in the case of programming, it would be here's your data, here's all your numbers, well, I want to add this, subtract this, do this, print this out, do some other things, and eventually get to a result. So that's kind of what imperative programming is like. You, It's like classic cognitive psychology problem solving. You have a initial state, and you want to work your way through that problem space in order to get to a goal state. That was kind of like what imperative programming was like. Was like. But all of a sudden, I actually think I have the book over there in my bookshelf. I, maybe I should go find it. The uh, a language came around called Smalltalk. And there was a, a language that implemented Smalltalk called Squeak. Do I have the book over there? Maybe I'll go get it. Um, that started doing things in an object-oriented way, uh, meaning that you created these fusions of your data and your functions so that you had these, these packages, and what you do did was get an actual representation of those things, and then you could basically do simulations. If I wanted to simulate a pool table, I would have a table, I would have 15 balls. If one moved, it would move in a certain direction. If something was in the way, it would hit it, and it would move. And it was, it was almost a way to do simulations. Now, it really gets popular in the late 80s when a guy named Yarni Straustrup writes an extension to the programming language C and calls it C++. Plus plus is for increment, so it was more than just C, C++. Um, C++ is probably still the most popular, even with Java, C++ is probably still the most popular object-oriented language. C++ is what's called a superset of C. Everything that you can do in C, you can do in C++. C++ is just the ability to do things in an object-oriented fashion. Um, then in 95, forget about it, Java came out and everybody went nuts over Java. Not because Java is any great shakes. Not because it's a really a great programming language. It's fine. I don't want to be a Java basher. Although I can be. I was a Java certified programmer. And I coded in Java for years. Um, 
Java was very popular because Java was free. Okay? Uh, free is my favorite word, by the way. Remember that. Java came along at a time where universities had to pay in order to have a Pascal compiler on their mainframe. Or they had to pay IBM for all these PCs, and they had to pay Borland for Turbo C++ to run on their machines. Compilers and computer languages cost money. And then all of a sudden when Java came along, Sun Microsystems, uh, Gosling, I believe, was the gentleman who invented Java, and he was working at Sun Microsystems at the time, and Sun Microsystems just gave it away. So all of a sudden, Java became very, very popular at universities. Because universities, don't tell anybody, universities are very, very cheap. So Java instantly became the language of choice in probably 90% of computer science outfits across the nation. Um, we are not very good at standing up and looking around the landscape and reevaluating our decisions every five or 10 years. Because it's been about 20 years of using Java and the landscape is completely different now. There's a lot of things that are free. Python is free. Uh, basically, C or C++ is free. You get Linux and you just use what comes along with the GCC. Uh, you can do some other, th some other things are free. Languages, for the most part, are free right now, but we're still using Java because we're a Leviathan and we don't change course quickly at all. But I digress. Anyway, between small talk in the early 80s and then C++ and then Java, people began to learn about object orientation. And as you know, if you hit the slides, object orientation is just a way to put our data and our functions, now called methods, together so that you give a blueprint or a class of what you want the behavior of your thing to be. And then when you use it, you get an object. You instantiate that class and make it a real honest to goodness object and then you run things on that object. That object holds the data and then you run functions on that to change things. That sounds highfalutin and theory-ish and blah blah blah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quick whip up a class. You have what's in your slides, you have the dice, you have the die, you have that student record thing that I have in there. Um, I want you to see as many examples as possible. So I'm gonna code something up from scratch right now. If you've seen any of the previous year's videos, you'll know I usually do a savings account. This year I think I'm going to do a checking account and I may add a little functionality because I may do something with interest. All right, let's go. Here I will say author Lars and then I will say playing with classes. Okay, so what's the first thing we want to do? Uh, what am I going to do? I guess what I'm going to do is a checking account. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to say class, look at our uh, idle, make it orange. Okay. And I'm going to call this class checking. All right. And then I'm just going to give it a colon and that's it. Hit enter. Okay. I usually give it a space after that. So now what's the first thing you do when you create a new class? I'm going to create a method, which is really just a function. And you know it's just a function because you start off with the DEF keyword. I'm going to define a function that's going to run every time I create an object with this particular class. And that method is always called the constructor. It's called the constructor in C++. It's called the constructor in Java. It's also called the constructor in Python. Now in those other languages, the constructor is usually the name of the class. Okay? In Python, it's dunder init dunder. Two underscores or double underscores are called dunders by us Python heads. So now that you are a Python programmer, you are duty bound to call them dunders as well. Okay, so do dunder and it dunder, and then I'm going to add parameters, and I'm going to add the word self. Self is a little nuanced and weird. When I write the class, I do not know what the variable that's going to hold the object is called. Okay? Self is a placeholder for that thing. All right? It's called... Think about it. If you know anything about C or C++, think about this. Okay? It's like the this keyword. Self is a placeholder. Self means I'm talking about myself. When I'm called this thing. Okay? When we instantiate, you'll see what I'm talking about. And then I'm going to take a variable called amount. I'm going to hit colon. And then what do I want to do? I think I'm going to print... Uh, you have opened a checking account. 
And then I'm going to create a variable. And I'm going to create a variable called balance. And I'm going to make it equal to the amount that we passed in. Done. All right. So now you have your constructor. When you call this class to create an object, it's going to print you've opened a checking account. And whatever number you pass in, it's going to set to that variable balance. Okay. So we have our constructor. We have the method that's going to run first thing. Constructor is usually where you set what are called your instance variables or the variables that are going to be particular to the object you're creating. Now, a second kind of convention that we have when we create classes is to create what are called getters and setters. Whenever you have instance variables, you can have more than one. We only have one right there. You usually want two methods for each of them. One, to get it so that when you're outside using the object, you can print out the variable, all right? And another one is to set, which means if I want to set it to a new variable, I can set it, okay? Because, and it goes into a long, there's a long convoluted story about this. Usually, when you first long learn about object orientation, you'll learn that there's different access levels to your classes. They could be public, they could be private, they could be protected in some cases. We don't do any of that. By default, with Python, they're all public. We're going to leave them public. We're not even going to talk about that. Like I always say to you guys, we only have 15 weeks. I got to make choices. So we're not going into all of that stuff. That's crazy. That gets to a, uh, an aspect of object orientation called encapsulization. We're not going to worry about encapsulization. We're going to worry about classes and inheritance and polymorphism and those things. Encapsulization, we're not worried about. Okay? That's almost like data hiding. There's like, there's no reason to, you don't need to see the behind the scenes working, so why bother? Well, we're not going for that. We're going to do everything public, all right? So you can do any changes you want to do right here in the code, but sometimes, classically, you're not able to do that, so the programmer will write what's called a setter method for you. Um, I'm not going to do a setter method because we're doing a checking account. I'm going to have two methods. One's going to call, be called deposit. The other's going to be called withdrawal. So, a deposit. Should I make it a deposit? It's a check. Maybe I should just call it check. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what I'll... Maybe I'll call it check. That's a good idea. Anyway, I don't need the setter. I'm going to set things naturally the way I want to set things. But I am going to do a getter. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say def and then get. And then usually we do lowercase get and then uppercase for the variable balance google hungarian notation if you're worried about that capital b and then i'm going to say self and that's it because i don't pass anything into it and all i'm going to do is i'm going to return self dot balance and that's it all right that's going to return to balance so whenever i call that i'm going to be have the balance sent sent back to me all right all right pretty good now got my constructor got my getters and setters taken care of for my one variable What's the next thing I'm going to do? I'm going to create the methods that give the object its functionality. It's going to be a checking account. What do checking accounts do? All right, first thing I'm going to do, instead of deposit, I think I'm just going to call it check because it's like writing a check. But that's like a withdrawal, so maybe I do want to do deposit. I'm going to do deposit. I'm going to say self. I'm going to say amount. And it's a deposit, so... I do not care. I should check to see if it's greater than zero, but I'm not going to be that crazy about it. I think I'll just say self uh, dot balance plus equals amount. Uh, if you have not seen that plus equals before, and I think you have, I think I did it in another video. That's just like count equals count plus one or accum equals accum plus i. That's just saying make self dot balance equal to self dot balance plus amount. So it adds it to the total. It's like an accumulator. All right, because if you do a deposit, I'm going to take that amount and just add it to it. All right. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. I'll print the balance out myself later. So then the very last thing we want is I'll call it check uh, self. This also has an amount. Now, this one has a little bit of a rub because I want to make sure if I'm writing a check that I can cover it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if amount is greater than or equal to self.balance then print 
and sufficient funds. And then else, uh, no, I just want greater than, because equal would be fine. And then else, I will print cut check for comma amount. And then self dot balance minus equals amount. And that is it. I'm sure something's wrong. I'm sure it's something that's going to blow up because I, I have a typo somewhere, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. We're going to find out about the natural way. So now down here, I'm going to test my little thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it L account for Lars account. And I'm going to make it equal to what? The name of the class, checking and my parameter with my amount. I'm going to give myself $300. How nice is that? Wouldn't that be nice? What a wonderful world. And then I'm going to print L account dot get balance. So I'm going to print it right out. See, I do my two little parens to call my function. And knock wood, that should work. Am I going to give this to you? I think I am. So I will say, save as. And then we will go to, not too far, Python for data science, spring, summer, where's the fall, 2017. And the root will be good enough. What am I going to call this? I'll call it checking. Checking.py. So now, let, let me run it first, and then I will go about tracing it and tell you exactly what's going on. All right, save. Oh, look at that. It worked. Okay, we'll see. All right, so over here, you see you have opened a checking account, 300. What exactly happened here? Well, I'll tell you. You ignored this because it was comments, right? Class kind of like defining a function. It's just put in memory for the time being, okay? So you don't really do any of this. You get down here. That's a comment. The first line that really gets run in this program is the second to last line. The variable L account is assigned an object. That object is defined by the class checking. And when I run the constructor, I'm going to use 300 for the amount. So do I have a class called checking? I do. Checking, so I'm going to run the constructor. Dunder init dunder, wonderful. Self, what is self equal? L account. Now I know the variable, okay? Because I'm actually doing the uh, doing it right there. So self is L account. Amount is 300, okay? So I print, you have opened a checking account. Look at that, you've opened a checking account. And then self.balance equals amount. So all of a sudden, the object that this, this points to has a single instance variable, balance, and it equals 300. And how do I know that? In the very la next line, I go into a print, and I go L account dot, because I want to run a method on that object. That method is right here, called get balance. So what's L account? L account is a variable holding an object created with checking. So I go to checking. Do I have a method called get balance? Yes, I do. So what does it do? It returns self.balance. So it returns the variable that was defined when the object was constructed, and that variable is 300. So I have 300 right there, all right? So I'm in pretty good shape. I'm going to want to print my balance a bunch of times. So I am going to put that in the clipboard, give myself a little room here. Now, what am I going to do? I think I'm going to say Lars account uh, deposit some extra money here. I'm going to give myself another 500 bucks. Isn't that nice? And then I'm going to print it out to see what I get. And then I think I'm gonna do it again. Just for S and G. So deposit 200. Now if I wanted to cheat, I could deposit a negative amount and take something out, but I'm not gonna do that. And then let's print that out. So let's see what that looks like. All right, so now I've opened a checking account. I have $300. Now I deposited 500 here. So when I go look at my balance, it's now 500 more, it's 800. So now I've deposited 200. I look at my balance again. Now it's 1,000. So now I'm kind of acting like a real checking account here. Okay? 
Uh, let's test our withdrawal. I'm going to say L account, uh, check, and I am going to attempt to take out, ready for this, 1,100. All right. And then I'm going to print that out, and that's pretty much just going to give me the same balance because if the programming gods are with me, I'm going to try and take out that amount. It's not going to let me because I have insufficient funds. So then nothing's going to happen to the balance, and I should get $1,000 still. Let's see. And there we go. Okay. So now if I come here, well, <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to leave this code for you, so let me leave that. So now if I just do write a check for 900 and then I print that out, now it does it. I cut a check for 900 and I get 100, okay? So what happened here? I'm not going to do the get balances, but I'll do the deposit. I did the last deposit here of 200. So what is L account? L account is a variable that points to an object that was created with checking. So I go up there and I look for a method called deposit is does it exist yes so i came up with the amount of 200 self dot balance which was equal to 800 now it gets 200 added to it so the variable gets updated it's now a thousand so when i print it print it out a thousand so this first time here i go to check and i try to take out 1100 well l account what is that it's a variable holds an object that was created with the checking class so i go up to the checking class and i say hey is there a method called check there is so I say amount is 1100. If amount is greater than self dot balance, 1100 greater than 1000, it is. I print insufficient funds and I end. And that's what happens right here. And then what we did here is we printed get balance so it was unchanged because we couldn't do our check. All right? Then the last thing we did was we tried it again, but this time we tried it with 900. L account, what is that? It's a variable, holds an object that was created with checking. I go up to checking, I say, hey, is there a method called check? There is. Self, comma, amount, amount is 900. If 900 is greater than 1,000, it isn't. So I go to the else. Print, cut check for amount, which is 900. You can see that right there. And then I alter the balance, all right? Then when I go back to the main program, I print the balance out at the end, and that's why you see that little 100. Okay? All right. Then I think that's enough for tonight. Um, I'm going to take this code and I'm going to put it up on Sakai for you. I know in the past 24 hours at least, maybe a little bit longer at this point, <coughs> Sakai has been giving people trouble. Let's hope it's not the comeback of X-Focus. <laughs> and the denial of service attack, which is interesting for us computer geeks on campus. Um, that was a bad time. I don't want that coming back because a lot of services went down. It was a real pain in the butt for people who teach classes. And I'm sure it was a pain in the butt for you guys. I do not wish that on anybody. Um, I'll put this on Sakai. You're going to have the first review video. I'm probably not going to get to the second and the third one because you have three. This is a three-week unit uh, until the weekend. But that's okay. You have slides. You have Zell readings. You have this. And this topic... You need to steep in it for a while. You need to see examples. You need to play around with things. Um, so it, that's a good thing. I'm probably going to be getting you the assignment early next week. So you have a couple of weeks to play with it. And you def I will definitely get you the assignment and all of your resources before the Thanksgiving break. That way, if you want to take some time, maybe late on that Friday or on Saturday, and do some Python, you're going to be able to do so. All right? I want to make sure you're good for that. Do not forget that a mere six days from now, your proposals are due, all right? Could you give me the proposal a day or two late? Sure. Like I said, I'm not a, a pain in the ass when it comes to deadlines. That said, you're only taking time away from yourself because you're still going to have to do the design document and you're still going to have to do the final code and the demonstration. And that's a deadline that's not going to move. So any extra time that you take for the proposal it's time you're not going to have for the design document. And that's time you're not going to have for the final project. So keep that in mind. All right? Uh, I am attacking midterms as best I can. I got to read 60 of them and put in comments and grade them up for you. And I want to do a good job. You know, you wrote, you wrote, gave your opinion. And I want to make sure I read every last line of every last paper. And it's going to take me a while. Hopefully, 
starting tomorrow. I'm going to bang out 10 or 15 a day. I hope to get that to you by the weekend, but I don't know. The, the best promise I'm going to give you is that I will get it to you before the end of Unit 5. But I'll get it to you soon. I just want, want you to know where you stand so you know what to do as far as moving forward. Still, you shouldn't. You should be doing the best you possibly can at all times. But I want to let you know what your grades are and how you're doing and blah, blah, blah. All right, then you're going to be getting another one of these in like the next three days. So I'm not going to go kooky with any more announcements. I'm just going to tell you to keep doing what you're doing. Stay on top of these things. Look at all this stuff early. And don't procrastinate, all right? And I'm probably going to do an announcement on it. I'll probably say something about it at the end of the last third video. But... In the history of this course, which I've been doing three years now, I guess I developed it three years ago. No, less than that. Fall 2015 was the first one. So this is like the beginning of year three. Um, I've had two cheating incidents. Both cheating incidents were in this unit. Okay? Do not look for things on the web. Do not... Use code if a friend gave you some code. Do not do things like that because in this particular unit, we're on edge. We, me, Hans, who's been doing this with me for a year plus, uh, Kasim, we're, we're, our antenna are up on this unit because this is the unit. Both times when we've had trouble, it has been with this particular program and this particular unit. So just, I would, it's, I would rather you did poorly and suffer than to cheat because believe me it's worse it sounds silly but it's worse for us than it is for you okay because you have to jump through so many fire hoops and so much nonsense and it's not worth it for believe me it's not worth it for you it's so much better to just get a middling grade than it is to get an f because you cheated in a course and then you have to jump through fire hoops and then when you go out you're gonna have to explain it because it's going to be on your transcript forever and it's just not, it's not worth it. Just don't do it. I used to say that, I always said this. said this when I was an undergrad. said it when I was in grad school. It's, especially in computer science, it's, it's easier to learn the material and do a good job than it is to cheat. It's so hard to cheat. You got to rename all the variables. You got to move things around, which you're limited to in Python because white space counts. So you can't really move things around that much. All right? You got to change the logic a little bit. So you're not an exact copy logic-wise. There's the physical and the logical. You have to change the logical. If you know enough to cheat well in computer science, you know enough to do a good job on the damn assignment from Jump Street. So why cheat? It makes no sense. Just a year ago, we had like 50 kids get an F in one of our comp, comp art classes because they cheated. And they're like the little 20-year-old little lemmings. We just looked at them. We're like, you're, you're morons. It's literally harder to cheat than it is to do well. So why would you ever do it? Forget about getting caught or this and that. You're here to learn how to do this stuff. Do it. It's literally easier to just do it and learn than it is to cheat. And I believe me. I can teach you how to cheat. I know how to do all that stuff. It's like black hat. Anybody who's good at anything knows how to cheat at it too, but... In order to cheat well, you have to understand how to do it. And if you understand how to do it, just do it. Why would you Why would you chance it? It makes no sense to me. Has never made any sense to me to this day. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why are you wasting your money if you're not going to learn and do things right? Anyway, I digress. I know I sound like an old fart. Um, you should be good. I'm going to get out of here. I'll get you a video in the next couple of days. And... Pff, you know, it's halfway through November already. In about a month, we're going to be done. All right? So soak it all in. Enjoy it. All right, I'm going to get out of here. You guys be good. And I'll see you in a couple of days, and then we're going to have some real fun. We're going to create an animal class, and we're going to look at a couple of different features that come along for the ride when we write our programs in an object-oriented way. We're going to look at inheritance, and we're going to look at something called polymorphism. All right? That'll be cool. All right, I'll talk to you later. You be good. Bye-bye.